Good evening. Welcome to Scotland at 7. It's the 4th of March and I'm Gordon Ross. Joining me in the studio this evening, we have Siobhan Tolland. Hello, Siobhan. Welcome back to the programme. Hi, I feel like I should move on now, so <laughs> it's still regular yep. now. She definitely should have a season ticket, Siobhan. And also joining us this <laughs> evening is the Glasgow Councillor, Cockab Stewart. Welcome to the programme, Cockab. Oh, hi there, but I'm not a Glasgow councillor. Um, I'm standing as a candidate in the Holyrood election, but I'm not a councillor. Oh, I beg your pardon. I've been misinformed. OK, let's get on with the programme. Uh, first of all, the coronavirus update. As of two o'clock today, a total of 1,700,950 people in Scotland have been tested through NHS Scotland Labs and the UK government's regional testing centres since the beginning of the pandemic. Of these, 1,496,895 were confirmed in negative, 204,055 have tested positive. There are now 500 new confirmed cases of COVID-19. This will be an underestimate of the number of cases. Not everyone with the virus will display symptoms and not all those with the symptoms will be tested. There were 24 new reported deaths of people who have tested positive. The number of patients in Scotland who have died from complications caused by the coronavirus COVID-19 infection now stands at 7,398. This number only includes those who have died having received a positive test for the virus in the previous 28 days and includes an additional 170 72 deaths identified by PHS on the 3rd of March and an additional three recently registered deaths that were identified by PHS on the 4th of March. Of the people who have tested positive, 726 were in hospital last night, 68 of whom were in intensive care. Now, as of 8 o'clock this morning, 1,688,608 people had received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccination and 100,058 had received their second dose. The latest UK daily figures published today show that 124,025 patients who tested positive for COVID-19 have sadly died from their illness, an increase of 242 since yesterday. This number refers to deaths in all settings and not just hospitals. Now to tonight's main headlines and loyalist paramilitary groups renounce the Good Friday Agreement over Brexit border checks. Loyalist, loyalist paramilitary groups have told the British and Irish governments that they are withdrawing their support for the Good Friday Agreement in protest at the Northern Irish, uh, Irish Sea trade border with the rest of the UK. The Loyalist Communities Council, an umbrella group that represents the views of the UVF, the UDA and the Red Hand Commando, wrote a letter to Boris Johnson and Ireland's Taoiseach Michael Martin warning of permanent destruction of the 1998 peace agreement without changes to post uh, Brexit agree, agree, I beg your pardon, I'll read that again, to post Brexit arrangements for Northern Ireland. The letter said that unionist opposition to the Northern Ireland Protocol the part of the Brexit deal that keeps Northern Ireland as a part of the EU's single market for goods should remain peaceful and democratic. However, the decision to withdraw support for a peace deal that underpins power sharing in Northern Ireland seems designed to sound alarm bells in Dublin, London and Brussels. The warning came hours after the British government was accused of breaking international law for a second time by the European Commission after ministers said that the UK would unilaterally act to give Northern Ireland businesses time to adapt to post-Brexit rules. Loyalist paramilitary groups endorsed the Good Friday Agreement and have no desire to reignite the troubles, but elements of UVF, the UDA and Red Hand Commando endure as a shadowy presence in Northern Ireland and some are linked to criminality. Joe Biden, while campaigning uh, in the presidential election last year, bluntly warned Britain that it must honour the 1998 peace agreement as it withdrew from the European Union or there would be no separate US trade deal. Siobhan, let me turn to you first for your reaction to this news today. Now, we don't often hear uh, very much from Northern Ireland's um, unionist community, certainly not in terms of warnings like this. What do you think the point of this, um, this gesture is? Uh, what is behind it? Why are they doing this now? I mean, I think that there's... There's instability now in Northern Ireland, isn't there? There's uncertainty. Um, and I think that ugh, this was inevitable. 
um, peace is so fragile in Northern Ireland and it took so long to get to that Good Friday agreement where everybody had commonality and now it's kind of just splintered and to I, I, I'm not a fan of the UDF etc etc but there, there's an element of sympathy to a certain extent because there's a feeling that the terms have just been ripped up. Um, unfortunately now however is we've got almost a kind of warning shot isn't that isn't there now by by that kind of the loyalist community group um that that we might have further further problems down the line here and the, my concern for northern ireland has always been a return to the to the violence and no one wants that no one ever wanted that um that that's 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 my big concern if i'm absolutely honest with you um it's just such a complex fragile issue now in northern ireland because brexit has just literally stomped all over the social agreement that was that was created in 1998 with a lot of hard work and goodwill from all sides actually um i hope um i hope that the same doesn't come from the extreme on the other side Let, let's hope not uh siobhan Cocker, let me bring you into the conversation now uh one of the things which struck me about this when I read it, first of all, was the fact that the, the unionist community sees um, Britain here as being at fault because what they're doing is they're protesting about the fact that there is an effective border now on the shore of Northern Ireland between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. And surely this cannot sit well with unionism, which uh, wants to be all inclusive as a part of the UK. Yeah, I sort of understand that. And I think that the, the fault there would be that um, there hasn't been uh, the clarity that is required and there hasn't been the certainty. We haven't been getting, you know, the proper answers uh, from Westminster about that. So obviously there's a vacuum there and people fill that vacuum because they're uncertain. They want to you know, uh, be part of the UK, whereas actually lots and lots of things are changing. Um, but yeah, the situation with Brexit, Brexit is that it has brought a lot of uncertainty. So when that happens, um, people entrench in their positions, uh, which isn't something that, you know, obviously that I would like to see. Um, as Siobhan said, um, I don't think that the world would look on it very kindly if the Good Friday Agreement was sort of like, you know, ripped up as it were, because it's taken, well, it took a long time and lots of world leaders were involved in creating that happening um and peace is very fragile it's very important it has to be protected okay thank you for that Siobhan one last uh, point uh, to this uh, of course the the UDA and the UVF and the Red Hand Command are not the only people are unhappy with the, the British government at the moment the European Union has said that it's planning to perhaps take the United Kingdom to court since the UK is supposed to be uh, enacting its uh, its pledge to put in place border checks between mainland UK and Northern Ireland, and it's decided unilaterally not to do that. So what on earth can the, the European Union do to the United Kingdom uh, to make them comply? It seems that Britain never had any intentions of carrying out these, these border checks in the first place. They're basically thumbing their noses at the, U, uh, the EU. I think so. I mean, I think that, you know, there was, you know, during the kind of long negotiations that we had, there was a lot of, especially the right wing um, press in the UK, kind of laying the blame at, you know, the European Union's door, being intransigent, being awkward, being, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, from my perspective, it kind of looked like the European Union was trying to deal with a kind of tantrum in a child in the UK and the Westminster process. I think that Westminster, I think we've seen this time and time again, they think they are above the law. Um, and I think that that's what we've got here. We will literally just do as we want. Remember the kind of the ideology behind the whole Brexit was we want to do what we want. We don't want to be subject to European rules and regulations, and that, of course, included the European human rights, etc., etc. This is what they want. They just want to determine their own rules and regulations. And I think that 
they were always, for me, going through the motions with the European Union. Um, I, it doesn't bode well for, for, for international relations. Of course it doesn't. And especially from a Scottish perspective, because we're sitting here going, do you know what? We want to have this really nice kind of close relationship with Europe. We want peace. We want this. But ugh, Westminster are doing what Westminster do. They just literally think they can stomp their feet and get what they want. They seem to have done so anyway with this. Anyway, let's uh, move on to our next story and we'll, we'll come back to you both for your comments in a moment. Now, the budget reports uh, warn of a return to austerity and fiscal stimulus failures. Two uh, key post-budget reports have criticised the Chancellor's spending plans for falling well short of what is required and warning of a return to austerity. In its post-budget analysis, the IFS uh, concluded that Sunak's spending plans don't look deliverable, at least not without considerable pain, with the IFS analyst Carl Emerson warning that if there's going to be some, there is going to be something that feels like austerity for at least some public services if we're going to keep to these spending plans. The Institute for Fiscal Studies also warned that universal credit cliff edge that it created will mean overnight reductions in incomes, which will create real difficulties for struggling families. Separately, the IPPR concluded that the Chancellor is gambling with a highly optimistic scenario, a failed to boost it like Biden by providing less than half of the stimulus required to deal with the scale of the challenge. It added that there was a striking lack of new support for public services, little public investment and no lasting boost to welfare for those hardest hit by the crisis. The result is the risk of a lopsided recovery where higher earners and big businesses bounce back quickly, but low earners and small businesses will feel the dire consequences of the pandemic for years to come. Commenting, the SNP's Westminster leader, Ian Blackford MP, said, As the dust settles, the devil in the detail is becoming clearer. For all the rhetoric, the grim reality is that the Chancellor's spending plans failed to bring forward the stimulus required to deal with the challenges and debunk the Tories' anti-austerity claims. Let me first of all come to you, Cockab, for your reaction to this. Um, we all saw R Rishi Sunak's much-vaunted um, budget the other day there and he's been claiming that it is progressive but when you're raising taxation for everybody in the UK to um, levels that have not been seen since the 1960s how, how progressive is that it doesn't sound terribly progressive to me well I don't think it is very progressive um, and I think that there was um, it's something about the tax thresholds as well that although on the surface of it it looks as though like you know if you uh, freeze the the tax thresholds um then it looks as though oh well that's fine then i won't be paying any more tax but the thing is those thresholds are set so that if you end up earning more money um then your taxes are going to go up um so you know that that doesn't sound very progressive to me um at all um also i think that sort of like the budget uh you know it was I mean, in order to create stimulus, um, I've said before that investing in sort of like capital uh, projects, you know, infrastructure projects is very mm -hmm. important and uh, the money isn't there for that. So that then also ties in with the lack of investment that's been shown towards our public services. And if anything, you know, well, I mean, there's been so many sort of inequalities that have been exposed by the pandemic, but it's been the public services that have been the backbone that have actually yeah. kept the country going. So not to have invested in those to the extent that's required is actually quite insulting. You know, so, I mean, on, on all of those levels, it's, it's very disappointing. Yeah, thank you very much for, for your answer there. Um, Siobhan, let me kick the ball over to you now. So Kaukab's saying basically that, um, that Rishi Sunak's quite happy to clap for people in the public services, but not happy to pay them. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> if we've learned anything from this COVID over the last, last year, it is literally that our poorest and most vulnerable have to take priority. Um, and yet again, we've got Westminster ignoring that bleedingly obvious thing for everybody. Um, everybody understands that that's what we need now. Um, the, every time you look at Westminster, every time they make a decision, you, you kind of hope that they're going to learn 
you know, but they never seem to. Um, this is just the same old kind of economics that they're, they're kind of ploughing. They never ever invest in the in in the poorer population and as Kakaupi said there is this real lack of investment in we kind of infrastructure and we're building off our social services and we're building off the welfare state this is what we should have been doing this is what a good budget would have done do you know what this is what a sensible moderate budget would have done um because it would have recognized the need to kick start the economy um but again it, it's just it's the same old it's like they never understand or they never care um that what we actually need is to protect those who are in trouble financially and otherwise at this moment in time but basically it, it's we're kind of just throwing them to the wolves again um i was reading uh, the joseph roundtree foundation report on it just mm -hmm. quickly um today and and that's basically they're saying that, that this is this risks more people moving into poverty now have we not got enough poverty? Have we not realised over over the COVID experience that poverty is so insidious for us? But here we are again, yet another austerity agenda, which we all expected, austerity 2.0. We knew that this budget was going to do this, but here we go again. The poorest people are going to be the worst off and there's going to be more and more kids thrown onto the poverty scrap heap. It's, it's not appropriate at this moment in time. Um, Siobhan, would you agree that um, since, well, since Margaret Thatcher's time and the death of big public industries in the UK, many, uh, some would actually argue that most people in employment these days either work for themselves as self-employed individuals or work for much smaller companies. And these are surely the very kind of people that need the help, not big businesses, not the, the wealthy, um, but those people who are the backbone of the economy. It, it's 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 not just the self-employed people. It's 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 the it's the Amazon delivery drivers. It's, it's the, the Asda wage, shop it? assistants. Yes, exactly. We wouldn't we wouldn't have managed to survive this pandemic without these workers. Um, it's the usual economic strategy, I think. Um, for for you know that that kind of extreme right wing ideology is that big business comes first. It's it's working on a very very outdated and antiquated trickle down theory that basically if you give the money to big business. Mm -hmm eventually it will trickle down to the poor people. Mm. Well, that's an economic system that's been debunked decades ago because it doesn't work because that's not how rich people work. You know, that's not how big business work. They work in their it's own interests. Yeah. It is. It's the smaller people, I think, and the smaller businesses, but the ordinary workers that we have to kind of, we have to prioritise. We have to prioritise their health, well-being, and their wealth in that. Um, so yeah, absolutely agree with that. We should not be pandering to big business in this respect. We should be promoting a healthier economy that's much more balanced. All right, Shabon, thank you very much. Well, we're staying with the same theme for the next story. And the Trades Union Council, the TUC, has warned the Chancellor is gambling with recovery. Following a warning from the Trades Union Congress that Rishi Sunak is gambling with recovery, the SNP has said that the Holyrood election in May is more important than ever to protect Scotland's future. The TUC has slammed the Chancellor for failing to act to create jobs, echoing the SNP's view that the overall level of public investment announced in the budget to stimulate the recovery has fallen far short of what is needed. The UK budget failed to deliver on the TUC's budget submission, much of which the SNP has been calling on for months, including extending the furlough, keeping the universal credit uplift, scrapping the five-week wait, increasing and extending statutory sick pay, increasing child benefit and tax cre uh, child tax credit, and abolishing the two-child cap. It comes after criticism for the, from the Institute of Public Policy Research, the IPPR, for failing to boost it like Biden with a major stimulus uh, to secure a strong recovery, saying that the Chancellor provided less than half the stimulus required yesterday. And analysis from the Resolution Foundation showing that household incomes and spending on public services will fall. Commenting, the SNP's Shadow Chancellor, Alison Fulis MP, said, It's shameful that the Chancellor disregarded the widespread calls to invest in and to strengthen the social security and to create jobs. 
and uh, in turn helped to secure a strong economic recovery for Scotland and the UK after the pandemic. By failing to boost the incomes and reject austerity with major uh, financial stimulus, Rishi Sunak has acted to increase poverty and destitution and to put Scotland's future at risk. The elections in May are now more important than ever as Westminster continues to gamble with Scotland's recovery. Um, first of all, Kalkab, let me turn to you for uh, your response to, to this. Now, obviously, this is still on the same theme, but we have now the TUC, the Trades Union Congress of the United Kingdom, also criticising this budget um, as falling short, not creating jobs. Nobody seems to be mentioning the word unemployment, do they, Kalkab? But it's been ringing alarm bells in my head for weeks that uh, eventually unemployment is going to climb, isn't it? Yeah, I do agree with you. Um, I'm very worried about that. Um, I mean, I'm working as a teacher at the moment and I know that there's going to be lots of parents um, as we, I mean, you know, there's lots and lots of parents that are barely sort of like coping. Um, and thankfully, we've been able to sort of like, you know, the Scottish Government has been able to provide sort of like free, free school meals during lockdown and keep that going. Um, and all of that sort of like makes such a difference. Um, I mean, once we start to come out of the pandemic and people start to return to their jobs, I think that's when we're going to see the real impact um, that actually a lot of these jobs are not going to exist when folks start going back to them. Um, I know that sort of like the uh, furlough scheme um, is being protected up until September, but actually September isn't that far away. I mean, if you think about it, you know, uh, it's been a year already that we've been in COVID. Um, so we've had a whole cycle um, that's there. And then up until September, really, I mean, it should have been a bit more open-ended than that in as much as for as long as was required. And then that doesn't put too much pressure on companies who might think, well, we've only got the protective furlough until September. I'm going to make these sort of like decisions right now based on what I've got in front of me. And that may well mean that you've got to lay people off. Whereas if they had that flexibility and they had that cushion, they might reconsider um, as well. So, yeah, I think unemployment, um, you know, not only is it, I mean, it's going to affect people monetarily, um, but their mental health. Um, you know, family structures, the effect on society um, could possibly be quite devastating, you know, on top of the pandemic already. Okay. So I'm okay. extremely concerned about that. Okay, Kolkab, thank you for that. Um, Siobhan, Kolkab also concerned about the future. I suspected many years ago, uh, actually, when, when Brexit was being first talked about, even before we voted on it, that the, the result of Brexit, if it happened, would be that the Tories would try to create a new sweatshop economy in the, in the UK. Do you think that's what we're seeing here? Do you think that we're seeing the future writ large in Richie Sunak's budget? I, I think it's always kind of been on the cards, isn't it? I think that we have this new... It, it's it's the new economic structure, isn't it? That it, you know, it, you know, the post forty five settlement for instance, we had an agreement that you know, um, relatively good wages, a good health service, a good social security service. There were there were certain minimum standards that workers were entitled to, and that included things like trade union representation, good wages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's been slowly eroded um, over over the years, and I think we're just beginning almost to see the final stages of of that process that um, it, 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 it's a very short-sighted economic outlook, isn't it? But what it basically is, it's, 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 it's looking specifically at the needs of, it goes back to what we were saying earlier on, the needs of the big business. And what they think they need is basically a worker that will do anything for as little as they can. It's very a dehumanizing process if you think that part of the, you know, part of the, the the move out of the European Union is also to kind of like start questioning the human rights aspect of it. That also includes trade union rights as well. But this move into zero hour contracts, lower wages, et cetera, et cetera, I think it is inevitable. Um, 
it also makes the path for Scotland and the decision for Scotland much more stark come, come, come May. We don't have long to make a decision um, collectively as a nation, but it does offer those two paths because Scotland has a very different attitude to that. Scotland still wants that process and still mm. wants that social contract, actually, where actually, do you know what? Our workers do deserve trade union rights. We do deserve a living wage. We do deserve not to be in poverty. That's the agreement. That's the social agreement that we have with the state um, is better for the economy and it's better for, for our people as well. They both 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 benefit in that respect. Um, but it does it does leave us with stark choices. And as um Kakob said this massive uh, threat of unemployment that looms over us is only just going to increase the inequalities that now exist. And we've mm -hmm. never been so more we've never been so unequal, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's just going to get worse. Well, okay, let's let's look further ahead still, and uh, still on the same theme. On, uh, oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, we're, we're going to move on a little bit further, actually, and uh, talk again about COVID nineteen and community testing has highlighted hidden cases. More than ten thousand tests have been carried out on people without coronavirus COVID nineteen symptoms since January the eighteenth, according to the latest Public Health Scotland figures. Now, of those, 251, that's 2.4% of the tests, were positive for the virus, despite people showing no symptoms. And they were asked to self-isolate and to avoid unknowingly passing on the virus to those around them. As of Thursday, the 4th of March, there are 24 asymptomatic test sites providing COVID-19 testing for people without symptoms in targeted areas. A further 24 sites across Scotland are set to open over the next month. Nine mobile testing centres, or MTUs, are also currently deployed to provide community testing for local residents, whether they have symptoms or not. The Scottish Government has committed £5 million in additional funding to support community testing programmes across the country, and 200, sorry, 320 military personnel have been deployed to support the initial setup, training, and delivery. And Colcab, this is an interesting story. Um, we, we obviously we don't think about this very much about people who we maybe see every day who look perfectly normal, but unbeknownst to us. Uh, over 2% of those people um, actually have COVID-19. I just don't know it. That's a bit of a scary thought, isn't it? Um, uh, well, it is a scary thought, but um, in my head, I'm thinking that if we all follow the rules and what's always struck in my head when we hear the briefings and everything is um, if you behave as if you've got it, then you're keeping yourself safe and you're keeping other people safe as well. Um, I mean, you know, from a school's point of view, obviously I've, uh, you know, we're um, teaching infants at the moment, so we've been back at school and um, I can certainly say that definitely in my school, we've got all the protocols are in place and we're doing, we're hyper vigilant about that. Um, and whereas the children, I feel, are relatively safe, uh, we've been prioritising parents gathering at the school gate and that was always the worry, wasn't it? Was that, you know, once we started to opening up again, oh. um, the people who felt sort of like perfectly fine. Um, and and I, I do get the fact that, you know, we've been in this for a year, people are fed up, um, they just want things to get back to normal. But this is the very time that if we want to have a, a positive um, sort of sustained coming out of this and opening things up in a sustained way, then we have to be hyper vigilant at this moment in time. So although it's scary, I'm glad that actually this testing is showing this up. And then that means that we can take um, action in order to prevent passing the coronavirus on. And as usual, that's everybody's responsibility. Okay, thank you very much, Cockham. Um, Siobhan, this, this shows that about two and a half people in every hundred uh, possibly could have COVID without realising it. I think many people, you know, ordinary people maybe didn't realise that before, that you could go um, walking through the streets with COVID and not know about it. The government seems to be taking action, though, very quickly uh, and deploying the military, I think. Uh, I don't know if it's the first time, but it's the first time I've heard it mentioned. Uh, have you heard any others? Have you had any other information, Siobhan, about the soldiers being involved in, in these setting up these these testing centres? 
Uh, no, not as not 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 as far as I I'm aware. Um, it is pretty. I mean, it's 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 a lesson for us all, isn't it? Um, in terms of the asymptomatic. Um, but I think there's a couple of issues that we maybe need to address in terms of the testing. And if you look at the Liverpool study, an independent sage are very clear on this as well. The problem with the testing that we have is a lot of people in poorer communities are scared to go for the tests, and they won't go for the test because if it means that they're positive, then it means they have to stop working. Right. And so you've got this dilemma here if, if it, it unless unless we because we've still got this big we've got this big gap in our system in terms of encouraging people for testing and encouraging people for isolating what we need to do is we need to give people the support to isolate we need to give them that and we're not doing that at the moment and that's a uk thing that's you know it's yeah. not it's there's limits to what the scotch government can do there but it's part of the reason why poorer communities are not, or lots of people within the poorer communities are not going for those kind of tests because they know that psychologically, if they're tested positive, it means they have to, they stop have to working. stop working, yeah. and and a lot of people can't afford to stop working. Um, so there's a real dilemma there. It's our responsibility as a society to give people the support they need to isolate. I think perhaps that's something which the government might want to act upon later on. OK, let's move on and to the further publication of the judicial review advice. Additional legal advice documents relating to the judicial review brought by Alex Salmond have been published by the Scottish Government. The publication of these documents follows the decision to release key legal advice in the handling of the judicial review to disprove allegations made about the Scottish Government's handling. The Deputy First Minister John Swinney said the Scottish Government decided it was necessary to take the exceptional step of releasing key legal advice to ensure that the public could have confidence that legal advice was not ignored or the process deliberately delayed. The documents released today should enhance that public confidence. In particular, it's clear that delaying the case, known as sisting, was only considered as an option in order to minimise the impact of the case on the ongoing police investigation. This option was explicitly ruled out by the Lord Advocate, who made it clear that it was preferable and appropriate that court-imposed reporting restrictions protect the integrity of any future prosecution. This puts beyond doubt uh, that there was any attempt to delay the judicial review so that it would be overtaken by the criminal proceedings. Um, let me come to you first, Paul Cab, on this. There obviously has been a, a lot of controversy about this, but uh, this is the Scottish Government opening up the books, really, isn't it? It's showing that it has nothing to hide. Yeah, and, uh, uh, you know, I think that's fair enough. I mean, I've been, I've been following it um, just the same as everybody else um, who's been following it. And we saw uh, Nicola Sturgeon, um, what was it, about eight hours worth of questioning. Um, yeah. And she answered all the questions um, that were put to her, um, even some of them that were put in uh, quite emotive language, shall we say, as yeah. well. Um, and uh, I don't think that went down very well. Uh, with the public in general and certainly the people that I spoke to um, I think that there's definitely sort of like political point scoring going on here um, and you know the Tories are trying to make uh, sort of this into a political you know they're looking for a head for this and um, you know this is clearly a very very complex situation um, and the the rule of law which is also very complex we as the public, we don't have access to all the information that the committees do. And yet, I think that what the Tories are doing is that they're being totally opportunistic about it. Um, and the stuff that they've been saying about John Swinney, um, you know, was just outrageous, really. Um, I mean, I don't think for one minute that, you know, he was saying, oh, well, do you know what? I'm not going to release this. I'm not going to release that. I mean, I would imagine that there's an army of sort of like legal people and advisors that are giving sound advice and it's not for me to comment on you know that process because that's what they do there um but i certainly trust john swinney to do the right thing at the right time and he has done that um i don't think that anybody would want to put anything out in the public domain that could affect future prosecutions um, you know, clearly mistakes have been made through this and we don't want to be in a position where, you know, six months down the line, um, there's more sort of like stuff uh, that then they throw and say, oh, well, 
you know, shouldn't have released that. So you don't want to be in that position either. But as far as I can see it, it's just total political opportunism, really. And it's unnecessary. Okay. Well, listen, thank you very much, Cockab, for, for, for that insight. Um, let me come to you, Siobhan. Uh, one of the things that struck me about this is with the release of this second uh, document or documents by Mr. Swinney today, does that, do you think, draw a definitive line under the conspiracy theory and just rule it out now? Can we hopefully move on from this now? Um, I, I, I hope so. I think Nicola Sturgeon um, did, did a lot to do that. Um, but however, I was very, very concerned yesterday that uh, Jackie Bailey and Alex Cole Hamilton were actually spinning their own conspiracy theories mm -hmm. um, based on misinformation and this this concept of corroboration over <laughs> Jeff Aberdeen and that release of the name, for instance. It wasn't corroboration. It was Jeff Aberdeen telling two people that that's what he heard. That's not corroboration. That's rumour. And mm -hmm. this is what they did. They, J Jackie Bailey said on debate night last night as well that this was it was corroborated. Therefore, Nicola Sturgeon was wrong. That's misinformation and that's rumour mongering. And these are people on the committee. Um, I do have concerns. I think the phrase, you know, kind of try, political scalping is has been used quite a lot by yeah. Lorna. Uh, Lorna, I can't remember her name I, from I the Green Party, but yeah. I think that that's correct. Yeah, I heard the committee described by some on social media today as a kangaroo court. Would you agree with that characterisation? That's, I don't think that's fair to be across the board, but I think that, you know, Margaret Mitchell, there was elements there where you think, oh, Lord, above, how are you getting away with that? And uh, Jackie Bailey looked to me like she was just relishing the fact of kind of trying to demean Nicola Sturgeon. There was clear political opportunism there. And they were lacking professionalism. That's not them all. That was some of them. They were lacking professionalism. I know I'm coming back to the issue of corroboration, but if you do not understand the issue of corroboration when you are investigating that process and you are peddling those uh, those wrong information, then you shouldn't have been on the committee in the first place. It was a genuine lack of professionalism, I thought. Okay. Well, perhaps they should uh, vet the committee members a bit more thoroughly beforehand. Anyway, let's move on to the United States now, and security is tight at the US Capitol after police warn of a possible militia attack. Today saw tightened security at the US Capitol in Washington, the scene of a deadly assault in January after police warned that a militia group might try to attack it to mark a key date in the calendar of a baseless conspiracy theory. A bulletin issued on Tuesday by the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Bureau of Investigation said that un an unidentified group of militia violent extremists discussed plans in February to take control of the US Capitol and remove Democratic lawmakers on or about the 4th of March. March the 4th is the day on which adherents to the QAnon conspiracy theory believe that former President Donald Trump, who was defeated by President Joe Biden in the November the 3rd election, will be sworn in for a second term in office. Up until 1933, March the 4th was the date of the inauguration. Early on today, there were no signs of protesters anywhere along the steel fence that was erected around the Capitol, the seat of the US legislature, after the January the 6th insurrection by Trump supporters. Inside the fence, about a quarter mile from the building, dozens of National Guard troops with rifles strapped across their chests were deployed, chanting in small knots in the sidewalks, on the sidewalks and in the bright sunshine. Um, First of all, let me come to you, Cork. We all saw what happened in January in the Capitol building. Um, the American uh, government obviously is clearly worried uh, that there could be a repeat of that particular attack. Um, how likely do you think that is? Do you think the uh, American militias, as they're, they're termed, uh, who support Mr. Trump, are likely to launch another attack? It seems that the FBI and Homeland Security think that the threat was credible. Uh, well, I can understand that they would want to take any threats like that um, very, very seriously um, because we did see the horrific scenes um, when, you know, um, Capitol Hill was stormed um, and people working inside were just absolutely terrified, you know, um, and I was listening to some of their testimonies um, and some of them, you know, 
didn't well think that they were going to come out alive and they were making phone calls to their families. I think there were um, five, and, five people died, is that right? Is yeah, that right? five people, I think so, I think that's about right, five people died. Oh. I mean, it just sounds absolutely horrific um, that, you know, uh, people could be whipped up into such a frenzy to get in. I mean, I had questions at the time of how they actually got into that building that one would have thought that the security there would have been extremely high. So, you know, there was lots and lots of questions to be asked. So on the back of that, it's not surprising that the FBI um, and the security forces are taking any kind of threat uh, very seriously. I think, you know, on the wider sort of like issue of misinformation, of conspiracy theories, um, sort of like peddling absolute lies as well um how irresponsible that actually is and you know for the want of a soundbite for the want of popularity for the want of ego and i'm talking about trump here i suppose um for all of that to to whip people up and then that spreads like wildfire it becomes like a mob rule where people think that i mean you know we have democratic processes and mm -hmm. i believe in you know uh being able to protest disagree but in a democratic way nobody's life should be under threat in that yeah. sense um and i think with trump i mean uh, it appears to me from what i you know read and hear and that may or may not be true um is that he's still not come to terms with the fact that he's not the president i mean he still thinks that he was robbed of it even though that was sort of like disproved um very emphatically um in spite of all his legal challenges um but yeah i suppose sort of like you know i could go off on a tangent here and i don't yeah. want to but wait, wait, i think they're right the to take it seriously yeah. <laughs> anyway, very quickly, Siobhan, if you would, um, your comments on, on this situation with security in the capital, what do you think? Are they going over the top with it? Are they trying to make a point, do you think? Well, I hope they're making up for, you know, past, past errors. Um, Donald Trump might be out of power, but he did galvanise a very strong on the ground mob, as Karkab said. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've got here is the QAnon conspiracy um, that is tied up with far right racist terrorism uh, this yeah. is white right-wing terrorism and this is what and then this is this is this is what happened um at the storming of the capital as well so no I, I i don't think so it's probably better to be safe than sorry and you know what it's probably better that we're over cautious at this stage um because of what we had under trump of course was a very very a, a big relaxation when it come to white racist terrorism yes. um you know so there was the, the you know we, we really i think biden has to make amends for that in terms of the new politics so yes i think it was right and and you know what the last thing we want is yet another militia uh, garner, garner outside the capital um because trump might have gone but you know what that process that ideology that yeah. discourse and that actual physical handling and physical militia are still there in america yeah. not just america across across the western world now these okay. people are still threats they they are um the right is the, the the extreme right are still serious threats to democracy here and um okay. and and we do need to take that seriously um thankfully nothing happened but q and on oh my god you know yes. this is it's yeah. who'd have thought this 10 years ago Okay, Savon. Well, let me move on to another story. This time a, a good news story about the United States. Well, certainly good news for us. Uh, the US is to drop tariffs on UK exports, including Scotch whisky. The White House has agreed to drop retaliatory, retaliatory US tariffs on UK exports, including Scotch whisky, raising hopes of improved relations as talks continue about a post-Brexit transatlantic trade deal. In 2019, the then US President Donald Trump imposed a 25% tariff on a range of EU EU exports as part of a 16-year trade dispute over state support for aerospace rivals Boeing and Airbus. Estimates released last month suggested that duty had led to a £500 million drop-off in sales of Scotch single malt alone. But the Department of International Trade said today that the Biden administration had ended the tariff. The move followed the UK scrapping punitive measures against Boeing in January. So, Paul Tab, this is good news, isn't it? The um, whisky industry was hit extremely hard by uh, Donald Trump's retaliatory 
uh, taxation. Surely this will give some hope uh, to the single malt industry in Scotland now that they can return to some kind of normality when it comes to trading with the US. Yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely, it's been crippling. I mean, absolutely crippling. I mean, we've got in, in Glasgow Kelvin, we've got some residents that actually sort of like do whiskey industry. Um, and I've been hearing directly from them how it's just been absolutely appalling uh, for them. Um, the tariffs, the pandemic, Brexit, all of that coming together, uh, the pressure that it's put on the whisky industry has just been awful. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is good news, um, but as far as I'm aware, it's only sort of like a temporary thing. I mean, is it a long-term solution? Yeah. yeah, so, you know, I mean, so on the one hand, yes, it is, of course, you know, it is Start good news, um, but it would be good. I think we need to go a wee bit further to have that security for the longer term and not be based on conditions. It seems to me that we're being used as a bit of a pawn here, aren't we? Mm, um, you lift this and we'll lift that. Uh -huh, yeah. Um, and how sustainable is that? <laughs> <laughs> That's not unusual at all for Scotland, I suppose. Um, <laughs> Siobhan. What's your reaction to this? Um, the, the British government's dropped some tariffs of its own. The Americans have dropped th their tariffs. Is this, do you think, the, th the start of a thaw in international relations? Yeah, well, I, you know, ever the optimist, that's kind of what I, I, I that's 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 what I'm hoping from this. I think that, you know, the, the four years of, of, of Donald Trump certainly raised the temperature in terms of trade wars mm -hmm. um, and, you know, historically speaking, trade wars um, often lead into actual wars. And that was always the concern with Donald Trump that you were never really, never really knew where it was going to go. Um, but yes, I think that perhaps that kind of just lowers the temperature, lowers the tempo and, and allows maybe just more discussion. I know it's conditional, um, but it does kind of maybe just move us back you know, it's Biden seems to be just constantly kind of, pick, you know, cleaning up the mess of Donald yes, Trump, yeah. doesn't he? But it does, it does allow a kind of a, a, a more negotiation and a more kind of a, a more civil discussion and Less trade deal. And that's what we want at this moment in time. Yeah, yeah I think that internationally it does kind of just reduce that temperature okay. and 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 takes takes the fear a wee bit out of it because you never know where trade wars end. You know, go. Yep. OK, Siobhan, thank you very much. Um, now we're coming to Wales. The Welsh First Minister has warned of outright hostility to devolution from the UK government. During an evidence session at the Welsh Affairs Committee, Mark Drakeford condemned the UK government's approach of bypassing the devolved governments through its so-called levelling up funds. He stated that for the first time since devolution, we're dealing with a UK government which is aggressively unilateral and that is and that there is outright hostility to the fact of devolution at the heart of government and the belief that the best way to deal with it, that's devolution, is to bypass it and to marginalise it, to act as if devolution doesn't, didn't exist. The Tory government earlier confirmed plans to sideline devolved governments and instead enable Westminster to dictate funding over key areas, such as regeneration and transport, rather than passing on Barnet consequentials to the devolved governments. Uh, briefly, if you would, Karkab, what's your reaction to this? The Welsh government seems to be echoing um, some of the complaints made by the Scottish government. Yeah, and I totally agree with them there. Um, I don't think that Westminster has any respect. In fact, it's downright disrespectful to uh, devolution. You know, they were saying, oh, yeah, devolution would kill independence dead. Um, well, it certainly hasn't. In fact, uh, is all it's done is that it's shown up that they don't honour any agreements. You know, uh, it was we, we should still be in the EU. Um, they have lied, barefaced, where's all the money? for the NHS um, and I don't think people are going to fall for it again frankly you know um, yeah. and there is that sort of like uh, a reasonable head of steam that's coming I mean I'm always sort of skeptical about polls and stuff um, but nevertheless I mean the majority of Scots uh, you know well 53% were at that 53% bit but then there was another poll that was saying that you know Scotland could manage on its own that was up in the 70s so you yeah. know uh, hopefully the truth lies somewhere in, in between. Um, but Westminster is totally disrespectful of Scotland. I mean, you know, I think that it finds all the devolved 
uh, sort of like nations an irritant uh, rather than having a respectful relationship. So as far as I'm concerned, and I would say that it's time for us to go our own way and have our own path, because frankly, we can do much better. Fair enough, Gorka. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Siobhan, there's not much left to say, is there? Gorka seems to have said most of it already. But now that the Welsh seem to be feeling the cold hand of the British government, you know, reaching yeah. into their devolution and bypassing it as well, you think this is just going to happen everywhere in Northern it's Ireland as well? It, I mean, it, it, it's it's looking increasingly likely, isn't it? It comes back to what I was saying earlier on about the UK's relationship with Europe. You know, they just want they just well, they want just their want... own way. They just want to create their own rules, and that includes the other countries that they're supposed to be working yeah. with. Um, I kind of feel for Wales, actually. I think the the, the you know the, the veils kind of getting lifted it's a wee bit, about, yeah. um, and that's very very strong words actually mm. from the Welsh government. Um, and I think that we might begin to see a sea change there. Um, the biggest the the biggest danger to the union now is Westminster, and we know that. But it looks like Wales is beginning to realise that as well now. Well, certainly the poll evidence uh, of our next story um, will go to some, uh, some degree to agree with you there. New poll, uh, a new poll shows a majority of Scots would vote yes in an independence referendum. A new poll shows momentum remains firmly with the independence movement, with a 53% majority saying that they would vote yes in an independence referendum if one was held tomorrow. The Savanta Comrades poll also reveals that 71% of Scots believe that Scotland would fare better as an independent country. The SNP deputy leader, Keith Brown, said, people in Scotland have the right to decide their own future in a post-pandemic referendum. The issue at the very heart of this election in May uh, will be who has the right to decide what kind of country we should be after the pandemic, the people of Scotland or Boris Johnson. While recent polls uh, do make for encouraging reading, the SNP is taking absolutely nothing for granted. We will work hard. Uh, we, sorry, we will continue to work hard for the people of Scotland and deliver what's best for the country as we look to recover from the pandemic. As an independent country, we will be in a partnership of equals with the rest of the UK, instead of having to put up with Westminster governments led by the likes of Boris Johnson, which we didn't vote for. Um, Colcab, um, another poll, if, if we needed another one, what's this, 23 polls now that show um, support for independence seems to be as solid as ever, in fact, seems to be on the rise again. Yeah, it does. And I think that sort of like, again, COVID has shown up um, many things and uh, sort of like, I think people can see the the different way that we have uh, managed to deal with things up here. Um, Nicola doing her briefings um, every day and the team, let's not forget, you know, the health secretary as well. And John Swinney's been there. So um, a team effort. Um, and from the scientists as well. But I think that's actually given a lot more confidence um, to Scotland in general to be kept informed. They're very clear. Whereas if you contrast that with the briefings that you get from Westminster, I mean, I don't know about you, but I have to actually try very hard to know what they actually mean. And, you know, you get bamboozled by all these graphs and things, whereas folks just want the facts. They want to be told, you know, straight what's going on. Um, but regarding the polls, I mean, you know, Keith Brown's absolutely right. Uh, the SNP and myself in that, not taking anything for granted at all. Um, when we've seen this before, you know, in the previous referendum um, was that, you know, there was sort of like uh, a, a flow towards uh, people wanting the referendum, voting yes and everything, and we were disappointed. We cannot be in that position again. Um, so we have to yep. make sure that, you know, um, that it is good, solid, and the only poll, obviously, everybody says that, that matters is the one on polling day, but, yep. you know, Boris Johnson cannot refuse the will of the Scottish people. He cannot do that. Um, you know, it's Scotland's right to choose, and depending on how they vote um, on May the 6th, then, um, you know, hopefully we're heading towards, uh, well, I'll be doing everything I can to certainly make sure that we head towards uh, Indy Ref 2 and uh, lead to independence very soon. Um, I think more and more people in Scotland quite clearly know that we can do a better job ourselves and look after the priorities of Scotland while being outward looking and being part of Europe and being part of the international stage.
Okay, thank you very much, Cocker. Um, Siobhan, what more is there to add to that? But um, I guess your, your own comments. I mean, the, the, this is another poll showing independence support is as high as ever. Uh, and I think by the sound of things, it's, it's beginning to climb. We've all heard stories today that the membership of the SNP has started to rise again after Nicola Sturgeon's appearances. What do you think? Is the SNP on the, on the upward uh, trajectory again? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, 5,000 um, was, was announced um, just, I think it was just before tea time, um, in terms of new members, membership to the SNP. I, I think the trajectory is towards independence, isn't it? And I think that we've almost had this lab like, you know, um, understanding of society now where you're looking at what Westminster's doing and then you're looking at what Scotland's doing um, in terms of, you know, the, the kind of COVID pandemic and the health response. And you're seeing this kind of, wait a minute, hold on, Westminster really are that bad, you know. And I do think that the Scottish, the way that the, Scot the Scottish government have dealt with it has actually shown up Westminster. And, and for all its flaws, mm -hmm. trust in the Scottish government is extraordinarily high. Um, and, and, and and that's partly down to Nicola Sturgeon. It's also partly down to the kind of, I think, the, the, the good work um, that the Scottish government has done. It's important to, to have trust in the government. It's an unusual thing in modern democracies to have trust in the Scottish government. And I think that that will kind of take us forward. Um, the, May is about the right to choose. May is about showing ourselves that we want the right to choose. It's about showing the national mm. community and the international community about the right to choose. And that's why we have to kind of have, go, go to the polls, get registered, get our postal vote if necessary. If you're shielding, remember, get yourself a postal vote and remember and vote both votes SNP. I know that it probably shouldn't be too political here, but that's the one chance that we have to show ourselves as a nation, but also show the international community and Westminster that we are behind the right to choose. After that, then we just start making the decision about what is it we want from the future, and that will inevitably be independence, I think. Okay, Siobhan, listen, I'm going to give you the last word there. I think that is a nice way to end today's programme. Um, I just wanted to, to remind our viewers, of course, that, that we are still in the middle of a, a crowdfunder, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, Kyle Cab, just before we go, because we, we do seem to have a couple of minutes to spare because we started a little bit late, one, one of the things that always puzzles me about these um, multiple question polls is that when you ask people a question that doesn't contain the word independence, but you say, do you think Scotland uh, could do, do better by itself, and 71% of people say yes, why is it that only 53% of them say they will vote for independence? I never could understand that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? I think that sort of like, um, I think, yeah, the, the spin on sort of like the word independence, I suppose I equate it to, you know, how uh, interviewers down south more often than not. Um, they tend to refer to the Scottish National Party as the Scottish Nationalist Party. Yeah. So it sort of like puts a different sort of spin on it, doesn't it? It makes people hesitate and question things. Um, and previously, of course, during the referendum, it was, you know, the way that it was put was that independence was a separation it was a divorce it was this it was that yeah. you know um whereas actually um the the civic independence of having healthy neighbors that you get on with and communicate with very well and trade with and you know are able to travel to um it's up to us to sort of like well I was going to say up to us to bust some of those myths, but actually a lot of those myths have already been bust, which is why I think that there is a growing confidence um, in Scotland being able to function as a, a nation, an independent nation on the world stage. Um, as a small nation, people are starting to look, and the, the COVID pandemic, you know, they've seen small nations handle it uh very well yeah. and New Zealand uh, being an example of one yeah yeah, absolutely. And I mean, are they sort of like more, I think they had a wee outbreak, didn't they, which they yeah. managed very quickly. There was a rapid response to that. Um, and in Scotland, you know, um, I think that the gov although 
people were saying capitalizing on so it's too confusing it's two separate messages um but the scottish government were always very clear with their messages i think it was when we had the briefings from westminster that they didn't yep. make it clear that actually it only uh, referred to england um which they should have done and that was irresponsible of them you know not to give so, the proper information yeah okay well listen sorry um, you were it's all right. Uh, it's, it's always nice to hear new voices on the program. Cock cabin, and you're okay. Welcome back any time. Um, but we have sadly <laughs> just about run out of time this evening. So uh, I just need to remind you, as I was mentioning earlier, that we are in the middle of a major crowdfunder at the moment. Broadcasting Scotland uh, is going to be there through all of the important events of 2021. But to do that, we need your help. You, the viewer, are the people who keep us going. And we need your help in terms of uh, support, financial support. So if you would like to become a supporter of Broadcasting Scotland, you can do that by following the instructions on your screen now by going to our website joining either as a supporter at five pounds a month or you can make an individual donation or you can volunteer but uh, anyway it just remains for me to thank both of my guests uh, Siobhan Tolland and Colcab uh, Stewart for being with me this evening and I will see you again uh, probably later in the week anyway that's it from Scotland at seven tonight a very good night to you what distinguishes Broadcasting Scotland from a website or blog, apart from our brilliant programmes? Hi there, I'm Gordon Ross. Are the costs we face to enable us to produce those programmes? These costs are significant and ongoing. However, our facilities are able to do so much more if only we had the staff. In the last year, some of our supporters have cancelled their subscriptions. In one way, we would prefer it if it was because they didn't like us rather than it being because of the financial pressures which we are all under because of COVID. The really positive outcome of our fundraiser is that at a time of economic challenge in Scotland, we will use your donations to create jobs and in a small way contribute to improving the Scottish economy. If you want us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster, able to provide an alternative mainstream television platform, then please support us. Scotland is going to be an independent country. Just imagine what we could do if we had even 1% of the BBC Scotland Channel's budget. Imagine. And then please consider turning your imagination into reality. Please support us if you can afford it.